So let me ask you today, whatever age you're at, 25, 12, 85, what does it look like for you to honor God with your bodies today? What does that look like? God gives us, there's a lot of freedom. I have freedom to do this, but what is beneficial for me? I think it takes great wisdom to know the difference between freedom and what's beneficial, right? Freedom, say, well, can I do this? Yeah, you can do it. You have license to do it. Is it beneficial for you? No, it's not beneficial for me. I appreciate Steve and others who've been leading here at Boulder Mountain when it comes to the missions of one mission. There's a banner outside. You've passed it on your way in, and Steve will be available after service. Uh, ask him questions. Uh, there's a number of questions I'm sure that came to your mind as he was sharing, and he's available. But keep those dates in mind. And let me just encourage you. I had the opportunity to go last October and just the relational aspect of, of being shoulder to shoulder, working on a project for hours and hours is a little warm last October when we went down. This is a couple of weeks later. Hopefully, it's a little bit cooler uh, this, this year. But if you've never been on a missions trip, let me encourage you to go on one. Uh, we have this opportunity. In the future, there'll be more opportunities. But would you be open? Would you be open? Why do we do missions at Boulder Mountain? Why would we leave the comfort of our home to go to a foreign land and serve? Because that's what Jesus did. And we were about following Jesus. That's what he did. He went on a mission trip. And so as a follower of Jesus, we too are to serve in a foreign land. If you have your Bibles today, I invite you to turn to the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. And as you do that, let me just pray. Father, thank you for having already met with us here this morning through music, through fellowship, through breaking of bread together. I ask that you would be clear. You would, uh, we would hear from you today. There'd be no doubt when we leave what you're asking us to do, to build our life upon you. What does that next step look like? Nobody needs to hear from me today. We pray we would all hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're wrapping up a series called The Search as we walk through the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to land on chapter 12 today. And the theme of the whole book is searching for meaning and purpose when it comes to our life. And there's two ways to live life, right? There is under the sun... S-U-N, which is the theme all through the book. Everything is meaningless under the sun. Or there's another way we can live life. Amen. <laughs> I'm already getting it from the foyer this morning. Under the S-O-N, under the sun. And when you live your life following Jesus, he gives your life meaning and purpose. Today, we're looking at chapter 12, which is the theme of aging. Every one of you, every one of you, no one escapes that there is a stamp on our bodies. And that stamp has an expiration date on it. Our bodies will expire one day. God knows what that, when that day is. Every one of us, we have an expiration. Do not use after this certain date, right? Now, some of us push it when it comes to food. We're like, ah, oh, that's still good for a couple more weeks. Well, it's a hard expiration date when it comes to our physical bodies. There's an expiration date approaching all of us. So we're going to talk about aging today. There's a few things throughout the book of Ecclesiastes for our life to have meaning and purpose. We are to steward things. We are to manage things. One of them is time. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Last week, we talked about money and wealth. How do we steward money and wealth as a follower of Jesus? What often gets overlooked is chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. So today, we're going to take a few moments. We're going to talk about how to steward and manage your body, your physical body. How are we to manage and steward our physical body? There is a right way to do it. 
The Bible makes it really, really clear. Your body has a limited lifespan. No matter what you do or how long you do it for, we will all have an expiration date. Now, there's some things we can do maybe, maybe to live a little bit longer. But the reality is we probably all know someone. Man, I had a grandma. I mean, just ate. It was grease growing up in Iowa, meat and potatoes and a veggie, right? We probably all have known somebody who are like, I don't know how they live to be 100 years old. And we've all known somebody probably in our life who lived really, really healthy and then something happened and they died really young. I, mean, I can share some of that. But those are probably exemptions, exceptions. There's a right way to steward and manage our physical body. Verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 12. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. The preacher, verse 1 of Ecclesiastes, this is his, this is his conclusion. There's, there was a day when we were able to roll out of bed and we didn't feel any pain. There was a day we rolled out of bed and nothing cracked. Uh, we, we didn't have to stretch rolling out of bed. Remember God in those days when everything is good. For anybody 25 and under here in the room today, now is the time to remember God. Right? <laughs> Remember, be grateful that you have a full head of hair. <laughs> These are the days, the preacher says, remember your creator. You can run. You can run as fast as you can, and you have energy still. And you, just the fact you can run, right? The fact you can, in the message translation of this passage, which is a great paraphrase. It says, there are days I used to go hiking, but I can no longer hike anymore. For some of us in the room, that's true. Like, I, I, I can't go to the top of the mountain anymore. Remember your creator. Remember, appreciate, take advantage of the things that you can do today because tomorrow you won't be able to do them. What are the things that your body allows you to do today? Go and do that today because there's a day coming you will not be able to do it. That's good stewardship. That's being wise. Don't waste the fact that your body can get you to the top of a mountain today. It's hot, so maybe not today in Arizona. Before the evil days come in, because there's a day coming where you're going to be like, man, life is really, really hard. And some of you, it took an hour to prepare to come to church today because it's, it's difficult, right? Getting prepared. Getting the walker into a car, walking from the parking lot to the church, and yet you're here. And can we just take a moment? That there's some of it, there was more of a cost involved for some of us in the room than there were for others today to be here. And I just want to commend those that I mean, you, two days ago you started preparing to come to church this morning. For real. You're thinking, who's picking me up? And, and who's going to take me? And who's going to help me into the room? And who's going to move my walker around? That's significant. Those are the difficult days. We're all, it's, it's approaching all of us. The end toward the expiration date where life is just really hard. You feel like every day is painful. My dad's 83. I talked to him yesterday. Yesterday was our family Zoom call. We all get on and we give updates. And my dad's 83, and he said, I, I have a sciatica nerve problem. And he's in pain all day long. He's, he's a specialist on Tuesday. He'll go in and talk to a specialist. But every day, every step he takes, every, and it doesn't help if he's standing or sitting. He just feels it all the time. Those are the evil days when the years draw near of which you say, I have no pleasure in them. There's nothing he's doing where he's finding enjoyment because life hurts. It's painful. And some of you are living with pain. That is biblical. Right? Aging is, it doesn't matter how many experts you, you see, how many doctors you visit. If you go to the best specialists in the world, one thing, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how healthy you were when you were younger, aging is a part of the natural process of life. I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened 
and the clouds return after the rain. First point today, my body belongs to God. It is his property. Uh, I don't own my body. God does. He created my body and he expects me to use it in the way he intended it to be used. All right? My body and your body belong, belong to God. There's some things that we can do with our bodies, but it's not beneficial. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both of them. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and for the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I say then, shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Flee from sexual immorality. This is important. He talks about the body here. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. Lying, stealing, stealing. I'm, I'm doing that to you. And sometimes in the church we talk about all sins are equal. Well, to a degree. All sins separate us from God. Big sins, small sins. Lust, any sin separates us from God. However, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. There's something unique about sexual sins. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor your gods with your bodies. In the Old Testament, God chose to dwell in tabernacles, and then David's son Solomon builds the temple. Chapters and chapters and chapters of specifics of how to build the temple. Beauty and gold and silver spare no expense to build the temple. Why? Because this is where God's going to dwell. Now, we read Ecclesiastes in light of the New Testament. Do you know where God chooses to dwell today? It is not in a building made by man, made by stones and walls. God chooses to dwell in your body. Your body is the temple in which God chooses to dwell in and do his work in. How we choose to steward and manage our bodies is a big deal. What we choose to put into our bodies is a big deal. How we, how we manage it and steward it, really, really important. A Harvard study some years ago says that after age 25 to 30, so over 25, your body's declining, hate to tell you. It's in the decline stages already. The average man's maximum attainable heart rate declines about one beat per minute per year, and his heart's peak capacity to pump blood drifts down by 5 to 10% per decade. That's why a healthy 25-year-old heart can pump two and a quarter pump, uh, quarts of blood a minute. A 65-year-old heart can't get above one and a half quarts, and an 80-year-old's heart can pump only about a quart, even if it's disease-free. The diminished aerobic capacity can produce fatigue and breathlessness with modest daily activities. Five healthy men volunteered for a research study at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. It must have sounded like an opportunity of a lifetime because they're going to get paid for three weeks to go and lay in bed. Do nothing for three weeks. But when they got out of bed at the end of the trial, it probably didn't seem so good. Testing the men before and after exercise, the research, researchers found devastating Three weeks, devastating changes that included faster resting heart rates, higher systolic blood pressures, a drop in the heart's maximum pumping capacity, a rise in body fat, and a fall in muscle strength. And we all have an expiration date. I don't know what that expiration date is for anyone in this room. Only God knows that, and I'm okay with that. I'd rather God knows, and I, I don't know that date. But how I steward and manage my body can add, can add days to my life, Proverbs says. How I steward my body, 
Am I active? Am I, am I eating the right things? Listen, in church, this is common. I remember I, w- I was guilty of this as a youth pastor in my youth pastor days. God, please bless this food of cinnamon rolls and Mountain Dew. Now, God is a miracle worker, but my prayer is God change the molecular structure of this food as it goes down into my body, right? God can do anything, but he also asks us to do our part and to be wise. And we're, we're to pray for health. We are to pray for health. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Pray for those in our church who are struggling with health conditions and who are sick. James 5 tells us, pray for those. At the same time, let's be wise, right? The best type of of medicine is preventative. What are some actions we can take today that are going to maybe sustain us a little bit longer? Some of us say the choices that we make. I want to walk my daughters down the aisle someday, so I'm going to choose to be wise in my health. There are days I don't want to go hiking, but I know it's healthy for me. There, there, it's like going to the gym. The best time is when you leave the gym, right? It doesn't feel good when you walk into the gym, but when I leave the gym, it's, it feels good. When, you, when you're done with the exercise, boy, it feels good. We were made to be active people, So it's it's really, my body belongs to God. It is his property. Now let's go into the rest of this chapter. There's a beautiful, poetic illustration here of what happens to the body. Some of us are experiencing it already. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened. What's he talking about? Our eyesight. Our eyesight. As soon as I hit 50, things changed. I'm, my, my daughters make fun of me because my arms are really short, and I, there's only so far I can hold my phone away from my eyes. You know, I was trying to adjust. But that's, that's something we were, we're all experiencing. Our eyesight is, is dropping and going down. The keepers of the house tremble. The arms and hands that keep the body now begin to tremble. The keepers of the house are our arms. Bodies are our house. And some of you, you're aware of individuals. You, you spend time with them. Their hands are shaking. This is thousands of years ago. This, is, this isn't recent writings and articles from the Mayo Clinic or Medical Association. This is from Ecclesiastes 12. The keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent. He's talking about the knees and the back. What happens the older you get? You begin to to hunch over. You get shorter. So I'm not too excited about. I'm short already. Strong men are bent. And the grinders cease because they are few. The grinders. What are the grinders? It's our teeth. Only two times you lose teeth. One is when you're a child, you get all excited about it. The beginning of life. that's, That's a fun time to lose teeth. But the older you get, there's a day where you're going you're gonna to lose, lose your teeth. The grinders are fewer, and it's hard to even digest meat when, when you have fewer teeth. The grinder seats because they are few, and those who look through the windows are dimmed. Right? Some translations talk about after the rain, the clouds come in. He's talking about cataracts. At cataracts thousands of years ago, it's not a new thing. Uh, cataract surgeries that you can have to address that. But cataracts roll in. When the sound of the grinding is low, right? Now you're grinding, there's grinding going on, but you can't hear the grinding because your ears are starting to go, right? Some of you are looking at me like, this is a really encouraging message today. <laughs> Hang in there. Ear... Our, our hearing begins to go. And you get up early. The rise up the sound of a bird. Some of us are getting up now. It's getting light out in Arizona at 4.30 a.m. now. Some of us are, are up for an hour already by the time we begin to see light. And all the daughters of a song are brought low. 
they're afraid also that the music. Now, touchy subject, talking about this in church. It's so loud, right? The music's so loud. The, the movie's so loud. That, that, that's, that's the sensitivity of our hearing. The music, the, the song of the daughters is brought low. Turn it down. Have you ever said that to your grandchildren? or to, Hey, turn it down. Why you got it cranked up so loud? They are afraid also what is high. There's, there are more fears. There are more, more concerns about life. I don't know what I used to be able to do. I'm, I, I don't know if I could risk that. And terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms. If there was the favorite passage of this whole chapter, it's this right here. The almond tree blossoms. Is that not a beautiful way to express aging? Some of you have beautiful heads of hair. The almond tree has blossomed. My tree, it's, it's dying. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to have an almond tree blossoming in my life. Our culture does not do a very good job of honoring our seniors. I've been in different cultures of the world. They do a phenomenal job. There is automatic respect to seniors and in the cultures, many cultures of the world, they are elders, right? And we have elders of the church, but they are elders. They have our respect because they have lived longer than I have. They know more than I do. Now, just to clarify, age doesn't equate automatically to wisdom, right? Experience doesn't automatically equate to wisdom, because you can do the same thing over and over and over and not have learned from it. Processed experience, right? That's, that equals wisdom. I've learned some things. I made some mistakes. I recognize it. Now I've, I've learned some things. Wisdom. The almond tree blossoms. I, I just want to say to our seniors in our church, just to take a moment, I'm so grateful for you. I respect you. As a church, we respect you. Thank you for what you bring to the table in our church. I want to hear your stories. I want to hear the wisdom that you've, you've learned throughout the course of your life. There are so many stories and experiences in this room that would, it would take weeks for us to hear them all. But I want to hear those stories. Do you have things, let me just speak to those of you, maybe where the almond tree has blossomed. You have some things in your life that we could all benefit from. It is not the time to tap out in the life of the church and say, I, I did my time like it was prison or something. Well, I did my time in church. No, don't stop doing your time in church. We want to hear from you. You can pray. And, and that we have some prayer warriors in our church, for some of our, our senior saints who pray. The almond tree blossom, blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along. The energy level just isn't there like it used to be, right? And desires fail. It's the only place in all the Old Testament where this word desire shows up. The passions and desires of life weaken and wane. He's talking about the, in Hebrew expression, the caper berry fails. The, the, this berry, the caper berry, was highly regarded as a stimulus to appetite and as an aphrodisiac. I'll let you fill in what the author is really saying there. Because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver, silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is broken, where the pitcher is shattered. Just a lot of illustrations where the day's coming where this body will take its last breath. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Verse 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Let me sum it all up. All 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes, fear God and do what he says. Make your life count by, by following Jesus. Jesus gives your life meaning and purpose. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty 
of man. We read Ecclesiastes again in light of what we know about Jesus. Jesus said something about his body. He said, three days you will destroy this body, but I will rise it again. He calls his body the temple. Jesus was the temple that they destroyed. And he says, but I will build it back in three days. Jesus referred to himself as the temple. And later on, Paul talks about our body as being the temple. Number two, Jesus paid for my body when he died for me on the cross. Do you want to know how, how much an object or something is worth? You know how much something is worth based upon what someone else is willing to pay for that. Your body is worth a great deal. Your body has infinite worth and value. Why? Because Jesus gave his life for your body. For your body. God's spirit lives in my body. There's nowhere that you can go as a follower of Jesus where you can escape the Holy Spirit. He's with you. The second you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells within you and resides in you and takes up residence in you. And it's a beautiful thing. The God of the universe is living with inside of you. What does that mean day to day for you and, you and I? What decisions do I need to make in light of that truth? What changes do I need to make in terms of how I treat my body in light of my body is the, is the temple? It's all I got. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You don't get to decide what you do with your body as a follower of Jesus. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. I referenced this earlier. John 2, verse 20. This temple took 46 years to build. The Jews replied, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Number four, God expects me to take care of my body. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, Paul says. So let me ask you today, whatever age you're at, 25, 12, 85, what does it look like for you to honor God with your bodies today? What does that look like? God gives us, there's a lot of freedom. I have freedom to do this, but what is beneficial for me? I think it takes great wisdom to know the difference between freedom and what's beneficial, right? Freedom, say, well, can I do this? Yeah, you can do it. You have license to do it. Is it beneficial for you? No, it's not beneficial for you. Number five, God will resurrect my body after I die. God will resurrect my body. I don't know what age ideal Kyle was. I think it's in the past. <laughs> is it the 25-year-old Kyle? Is it the 20? Is it the 18? I don't know, but it's going to look a whole lot better than this. That's what we long for. One day you're getting a new body. Hoping his full head of hair, a <laughs> little bit taller, six foot maybe. It's what you and I long for. It's what we desire. It's what's created in us. God's going to give you a new body one day. This body is going to fail. We're, we're to pray for health concerns and health things. But we're also to be sober-minded about the fact that we are going to age. That this is a part of the aging process. As a follower of Jesus, embrace it. Let me just encourage you to have the confidence and the wisdom to embrace it. And say, oh, God told me about this in Ecclesiastes 12. This is not new to me. This has been here all along. What does it look like to steward your body well? First Corinthians 6, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. 1 Corinthians 6.14. And what happened to the body of Jesus? He stewarded his body perfectly. He used it perfectly. He worked with his hands. He 
whether he was a masonry or a carpenter, wood carpenter, there's debate over that, but he, he was a blue-collar worker. He walked a lot. I don't know if he counted his steps, but they walked a lot. But he never experienced the aging that Ecclesiastes 12 talks about. We have the ability to manage and steward our bodies because his body was crushed for you and for me. His body was crushed. His body was beaten. He went willingly to the cross so that you and I might have the gift of aging. You're like, it's a gift? Yes, it's a gift. Every day we have is a gift. And I get, you get to experience and you get to face the aging of this world, the brokenness of this world. You get to do it with grace and with confidence. Sometimes I talk to people like, oh, the, I just, I met a really grumpy old man. I don't know if you've ever had that thought or had that experience. Let, let me tell you something. Grumpy old men did not wake up one day grumpy old men. They were grumpy middle-aged men and they were grumpy young men. Your attitude just gets accentuated as you get older. The things in your heart begin to come out. Some of you, you know. You were around your parents at the end of their life, and they were saying some stuff like, whoa, mom, dad, easy. And so your attitude you get to address now, your heart, your convictions, your beliefs, how you treat people. Today, how you address that today is going to impact you when you're 85 on your deathbed, how you treat people. It's not, a, it's not an age indicator. I had the opportunity this past week, there were, there's, there are a number of people in our church I just have so much respect for. Little by little, I've gotten to know some of the folks in our church. There are some seniors in our church who've been through a lot of things at Boulder Mountain. I mean, like 10 pastors, hopefully only 10. But they've, they've been through a lot of history of this place over 40 years. And I just love listening. I have seen this before different things, and they've served in a lot of different ways. I just want to, as your pastor, I want to say thank you to those of you. You know who you are. Thank you for your commitment to this place. We stand on your shoulders. And I had an opportunity. I started asking a few people, like, hey, would you be willing to share with the church some of your wisdom that you've learned over the years? And we didn't have time to have everybody share. But Gary and Nancy Dodd, they're sitting in the back row. They were willing we talked about the logistics of having a panel up here on stage, and it was just going to be too difficult. But they allowed me to show up with my iPhone in their house and just press record, and they shared a little bit. And uh, Gary and Nancy, thank you. And we're going to just take a few moments and listen to some of the things that they, they shared. Uh, he also sent me an email with some things that he sent his family. Uh, I view Gary as a patriarch. It's, an, it's a biblical word, kind of the leader of his family. Nancy, a matriarch, and he wrote some things down and sent it to his family. And let me encourage you, if you've not done that, for those of you in that stage of life, if you've not summarized some wise statements and passed it on to your family, do that. Put it in writing. And I'll come back up and, and share those with you. But take a few moments. We're going to listen to Gary and Nancy Dodd. Thanks for the, let me, the grace of an iPhone recording them, but let's, let's watch this. Well, really, um, it, it came after I tried to determine what it was that, or how I was influenced from when I was smaller, even younger than 25. Um, we came from a broken home, my brother and I, and uh, calm and complacent. No. Compliant. Uh, Compliance uh, is a word that um, I live by. Okay, keep a low profile, do as you're told. Okay, and I lived that throughout my high school years, let's say. Mm. And uh, <laughs> after high school, I went into the military looking for another bed and breakfast, <laughs> but ran into the same thing: do as you're told. I didn't really always measure up to who I wanted to be in my mind's eye. But again, it gets you through the system. Mm -hmm. 
It also worked itself out in my pro professional career. Uh, I was a corporate ladder climber. I wanted to grow in the corporate world. And there's a cost to that because not everyone in the corporate world uh, we're not our believers, and uh, a lot of the corporate world likes to play. So I became a player. Mm. And that was part of not being who I really felt I wanted to be as a person, but how did I get there? And it was through some counseling, through some mentorship with uh, someone I trusted, that was also very authentic in who he was. And uh, then I began to grow in my understanding of transparency and authenticity and who I was in reality. Mm -hmm. And then I tied that all in with what I was being told or taught with respect to the biblical principles of who God was, who I can be. Can I be really everything that God says a man can be? Mm -hmm. You can. Yeah. Okay. So that was part of my, my travels there. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came to that point where I says, okay, God, uh, I really want to be authentic. I really want to be who you have created me to be but I'm going to need a lot of help. Okay. And they, through um, those you know, different uh, relationships and through the teaching that I received at the, you know, during that time, it became real for me. So hopefully that's who I am today. Mm. We all have stories in our lives and not everyone, family, our three daughters, you know, like you, uh, we needed to get to a point where we have no secrets. Mm -hmm. okay? And in order to get to that point, you have to have a starting point, and that starting point is being real with everything that you have been mm -hmm. and that you are right now. Yeah. And when, I, when you talk about that and get that off, then you don't have to wait for the other shoe to drop. Who's going to walk in and tell somebody about a story that they know about you? Yeah. So it's that self-protection doesn't have to be a part of who you are anymore. Well, um, fortunately, um, meeting my husband, um, he wanted me to meet the family that had a big influence in him. When he was growing up, um, he lived a good part of his life in the children's home. Mm -hmm. And um, the couple that led that home and was in charge of it, they were just a very godly couple, and he wanted me to meet them. And so, I just was so impressed with them, and they just took me under their wings. And I came from a broken home. So their influence on me um, was so... I can't tell you how much it meant to me that they... Um, took you in. They did. Yeah. They just took me in under their wings. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my, when we had our own family, being able to pass on what I never had mm -hmm. is, is a gift that I'll never, ever forget. Wow. You want to have... strong people in your life that are following Jesus. To know the reality of and seeing um, their lives that they have today in Christ 
is a gift that God has given both of us um, that is immeasurable. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's it, it is it is truly a, a gift mm -hmm. that we can see in action and in that enter into it with them because they they ask us they invite us into the areas of their life that are not just difficult but the ones that are joyful mm -hmm. you know God says to weep with those who are weeping and to, and to laugh with those who are joyful. Mm. And we can do that. Mm. And um, the other gift perspective is, is that they are so in tune with our relationship and our needs. They are need meters for us. Mm. <laughs> and uh, that's another gift. It's just so fun to watch. <laughs> it is. It's it's a gift to be able to watch your kids grow up and follow Jesus and then see them give Jesus to their kids. Pass it on. That's a gift to watch them pass on. Can I and just add one thing? Remember, we got the video here from Megan that her three-year-old son came up to her and says, I've got Jesus in my heart. Mm. And it was a terrific video. <laughs> you know, I, one of the things that I said in my little answer to your, your questions was that I've, as a man, an authentic man now, I've learned that it's okay to cry. That was a time. God's been good. He's provided, um, not just with our daughters, but uh, and I have no fear about the future. Uh, we know whose hands that we're in, mm. and I am convinced <laughs> that there's something better. Yeah. So, um, no, I'm not fearful. Um, um, I'm just not. Mm -hmm. um, I know that God answers prayer. We've seen that evidence for, for a long time. Yeah, thank you, Gary and Nancy Dodd. It could have been any number of individuals in our church sharing their wisdom. They've been married 60-some years. 62. They have grandchildren and great grandchildren. Did you catch it though? God changed their family tree. Broken home, broken home, didn't know Jesus, didn't know Jesus. And now they have descendants who are walking with Jesus. It, it took some work. And I don't know what, how that plays out in your, your personal life. I don't know what choices and changes need to occur so that the history isn't repeated in your, in your life. There's some statements of wisdom. I'm going to send this out to the church later this week, just some statements that Gary passed down to his family. I'm like, can you share that with your church as well? So I'll send that out to the church. But let me pray. I'll bring the worship team up. As, as I close in prayer. Father, thank you that you have given us a gift of this physical body. We recognize this morning it has an expiration date. And I pray that we would be wise in how we steward it. That, Father, Holy Spirit, if there are changes that need to occur in how we steward and how we manage, how we go about our day daily activity, our weekly activity, if there are rhythms in our life that need to be added or taken away, that you would make that clear to us. Holy Spirit, have your freedom in this room. Be, be honest with us, be gentle with us, um, and help us, give us the wisdom and the courage to respond accordingly. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. 
I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.